Folks, David here on the Vintage Future once again. I hope everybody is doing really, really well. And today I just want to let you know what my denim journey has been. Uh, Obviously, I've been doing a lot of denim content lately, and I haven't really in the past. Uh, It's mostly been boots. Uh, The reason for that is the denim stuff is kind of backlogged because denim is a long-term review, you know? And most denim is about the same when it's new. Most raw denim anyways. Most, you know, like raw denim might be a little different here and there, but like it's all basically the same shade of blue, (laughs) indigo. And so denim tends to be a long-term review. Uh, The variance in boots is much greater. Whereas like most denim is the same color, the same basic setup, like a five pocket jean of some kind usually. Right, so anyways, uh, you usually review it not when it's brand new, but when you've worn it for a long time or something like that. Anyway, so I'm backlogged, so that's why all the denim content is coming out, and you probably won't see a whole lot after I'm finished with some of the stuff I have planned. Anyways, I want to talk to you about my denim journey, though. My story with denim. Okay, so I got my first pair of raw selvage denim. Man, I want to say, like... 2018 maybe maybe it was 2017 honestly yeah doesn't matter anyway so I got it a few years ago five six seven years ago maybe and up until that point I loved jeans just like a lot of people do but didn't really know much about them and I showed up to a bible study at my church and one of my friends Tom showed up wearing what I later found out was a pair of tapered 21 ounce unbranded raw selvage denim jeans but he had worn his for I think about a year year and a half and so they were faded a lot and he had gotten his from Blue Owl up in Washington I asked him all these questions it was like see, seeing those it was like seeing denim in 3d for the first time it's like oh my goodness I've never seen this depth of dimension in jeans before it's like I saw the real thing for the first time so that ended up in me getting like three pairs of unbranded jeans to try and ultimately had to like return two of them and I finally landed on this straight fit pair they're they're true straight uh, unbranded is like a, it is a true straight it's like the same measurement at the knee as it is at the hem so it looks a little bit like a boot cut honestly it looks like it flares out at the bottom but the measurement there is the same so it's a low rise straight leg 21 ounce they barely fit later I find out that I need like a mid to high rise um, they barely fit they were really not that comfortable my mobility was greatly restricted but I did wear those a lot you know, for what they were, and and they faded pretty nicely. And so that was my first experience with raw selvage denim, and and I was hooked. I had been into the boots for a long time. Obviously, I'm still more focused on the boots, but I was like, okay, this is is my gene from now on. But I needed to perfect it, right? There were some some issues, like I said. So I moved on to a new brand called Naked and Famous. Uh, On the business side of things, they are kind of from the same source. They're affiliated with unbranded, right? Um, Naked Famous is like the quote-unquote real brand and Unbranded is their outsourced uh, budget version, right? So I think they're both owned by this company called Tate and Yoko, right? So tried Naked and Famous. Tried, I don't know how many, I can't remember. It was like six pairs though. I tried Easy Guy, I tried Weird Guy, I tried Super Guy. I think there was like a Super Skinny Guy. Yeah, I tried all these things, different sizes. I I even tried their duck canvas pants. And same thing. Just kept having fit issues, usually with the top block, sometimes with the leg. Still not quite enough mobility. I finally landed on Weird Guy, and I wore a couple pairs of Weird Guy for, I want to say, like six months. And I had a pair of, I think it was Easy Guy. Man, it's it's hard to remember because they're... Yeah, the names they use are not always the most descriptive. Like weird guy. Like, what does that even mean? Like, is that a is that a relaxed taper? Is that a straight leg? 
um, easy guy like what, what's easy about it is it relaxed is it you know is it you know what's easy you know so I don't know I don't I don't always remember but I landed on weird guy I had even tried to tried some like stretch selvage and stuff from them it was really cool um, some notable ones that I tried were I think they have one called it was called like midnight blue or something like that really really dark wash stretch selvage beautiful jean uh, sanferized they also had cerulean blue or carillion blue I don't know how you say that but a really light fade it's like almost like the classic Wranglers color like what Woody on Toy Story wears that kind of jean loved it faded really light um, that, that was a cool uh, jean that I got and yeah I tried a couple other ones Making it famous is fun. But yeah, ultimately, Weird Guy was good, but it's still a little bit shallow in the top block. So then I moved on to Brave Star. So obviously, I'm still dealing with a bunch of budget brands at this point. Unbranded, Naked and Famous, Brave Star, all budget brands, but solid. So this was cool because it's like, oh, made in the USA in California where I live. Right on. I tried a few cuts from them. I tried some tapered legs and all this stuff. Stretch, non-stretch, uh, black denim, indigo denim probably like five pairs maybe six ultimately it was like okay the true straight that's the direction I want to go but again the issue is mobility the top block was just still not roomy enough mobility issues um, but they're a good jean they're a good workhorse jean I saw a pair my brother's friend showed up at my brother's bachelor party like a few months back and he had a pair he'd had for like I want to say six or seven years um, which would have been, I think, when Brave Star was just starting. And they looked amazing. Uh, he had faded those things for, yeah, like six or seven years. So, cool, basic, solid jean. You're never going to get anything super, super, super special from them, but you could just wear Brave Star the rest of your life as long as they fit and you would have what you need. They get it done. So, I loved the jeans. I loved the, the fabric and everything. I wasn't into unsand fries or anything like that at this point yet their sand fries down it was it was cool you know and some of their stuff is like new old stock cone mills I had a pair of those that was cool but yeah just still didn't have the right range of motion in the jeans I, I felt cramped not enough seat room not enough ballroom and so ultimately those I needed to move on from as well and as you could tell at that time I was still like straddling the fence of straight leg and tapered leg denim. I, I still wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do. I was experimenting a lot, and that's good. You should experiment. So from there, I ended up getting my first Japanese denim, like Japanese-made denim. I got a pair of Tanuki. It's called a Yurai. So that's that was the, the, the series. It, it was the Yurai series first Japanese denim. It was unsanforized, one wash, first time I had ever had anything unsanforized. And let me tell you, not just because of the unsanforized character of the fabric, but the level of artisanry and creativity that the Japanese put into their denim, it was like incredible, mind-blowing. You know, I think the American denim is, is fantastic. Obviously, we were the ones that created the blue jean as we know it. But it tends to be a little more workhorse, utilitarian, workwear, you know, meat and potatoes, down to earth, straightforward, right? And, th and that's cool, and that's why we love it. But it was a privilege. It was, it was an experience. It was so meaningful. It was so rewarding just experiencing that, the art in jeans. I just never realized that it could be an art until I tried Japanese denim. It's one of those things you hear about, but you don't really know until you try it. So when I had those jeans in my hands, it was like, wow, this is insane. Like uh, the lined pockets and the way they lined the, the back pockets, um, they use this really soft but thick and robust herringbone fabric. It was like a, a white with cobalt blue herringbone pattern in the pockets for the pocket bags which kind of matched the cobalt blue weft incredible as I said the texture of the fabric just a little bit of slub and 
irregular weave and all that. And it was a high rise, relaxed taper. So it was kind of the best of all worlds. Like I'm obviously more into classic fits now, but if you were gonna choose one gene that hits the intersection between like all the different gene types, like this is the one that you would choose, I think. You would try you would choose a, a high rise relaxed taper. So yeah, great fit and all. I loved it. Can't remember what the leg opening was. I think it was like seven inches. Maybe it was like six and three quarters. No, I think it was like seven. Anyways, it was great. Ultimately, I started to move away from tapered leg jeans, but not until I had already tried another pair of Japanese denim. I got some Oni Secret denim, again, in a high rise, relaxed taper. That fabric, there, there's nothing like it. It's a 20 ounce fabric, so you'd think it'd be stiff like my unbranded 21 ounce jeans. But no, I don't know what they do to it. It's a really loose weave for one, but those those yarns are super soft. I don't know if they like pre-treat them or something, but they're very, very soft. You would not think you're wearing 20 ounce denim. The, uh, the Urize, those were like a 16 ounce, and they felt stiffer and heavier than the 20 ounce Oni. The Oni Secret Denim, one, the color, there's nothing like it. And as I said, the the softness of it is, is really cool. It's almost like a, it's not quite a teal. It's definitely still a blue, but it's got a lot of green in it, like sea foam or whatever, I don't know. And I wore those for a while and really loved them until finally I got out of that tapered leg thing. But I have some friends that wore them for a while and they fade so nicely. Uh, Chicho Blanco, Patrick, he has a pair that he wore for the Indigo Invitational, and he wore them for over a year. I actually met up with him at the Oakland Standard and Strange and got to see him when they were, I think, like eight months in, and they just looked exceptional, like stellar. Totally what you want modern raw denim to fade like. So that was really cool. Ended up moving those on. And this is when I jumped into classic straight denim with both feet. I ended up getting Sugar K 1947s off the Hanoya website. The cool thing about those is they were basically like the Japanese version of the Brave Star, except they were, you know, more classic, more accurate to a 1947 Levi 501. It's an, it's an actual repro of sorts. But their budget, you know, it's like $140 or something like that for these. So yeah, they're hitting right at the same price point as brands like Brave Star, but you're getting something that's unsanforized one wash, just like those Japanese denims that I had tried, Tanuki and Oni. But it's in, yeah, it's in that classic fit. Higher rise. Finally, finally, the first pair of jeans I had where I felt like everything came together because the the top block from the Tanuki jeans and the Oni jeans was really good. It was like, okay, now I have that mobility. I found out I needed a higher rise. But still a little constricting in the legs, especially for some of the wider boots I was getting. Honestly, this is funny. I had been planning on trying classic fit denim and pants in general anyways. But ultimately what pushed me over the edge wasn't a desire for that itself. It was simply the fact that the first stitch down Thunderdome started, the Patina Thunderdome, and I got some highliners from Brass Tokyo Clinch. And in the initial try on, just to make sure they fit, I didn't wear them obviously because I hadn't started the competition yet, but just putting them on, I realized, dude, this relaxed taper thing, I was like, what a pain in the butt, I gotta pull this thin pant leg up and fight my calf and all that. So I'm like, I'm going to get two pairs of Buzzricks and uh, Chinos, an olive pair and a, a beige pair. I'm going to get a pair of straight leg denim. That way I can just pull those pant legs right up. Nine inch leg opening or more makes it really easy. Lace those 14 inch boots real quick and then pull the pant leg down. I don't have to like fight with it. So that's what happened, and I started wearing them. I got them hemmed and everything, and I really love them a lot. Super comfortable, easy to get the hands in the pockets of the sugarcane 47s. 
and I wore those for, well, it was off and on, all together probably six months, but I had them for like over a year before they got shrunk in the dryer on accident by a family member, and then I couldn't wear them, they were too small, so I gave them to a friend, I see him all the time, and I get to vicariously watch those fade, but uh, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to need some more denim, so because I can't have no denim, right? So this is when I got the Black Horse Lane Ateliers. I think that's how you say it. Ateliers. SE1 in their Hewitt Heritage Fabric. This wasn't going to be a staple jean. This wasn't going to be a workhorse go-to everyday jean. This was going to be a specialty jean. But I saw Ilya Ilcuts on Instagram wearing these all the time. And the fabric was like nothing I had ever seen. Come to find out it's a special edition fabric from this mill called Hewitt Heritage Denim Mill in Halifax in the UK. They're doing awesome stuff. They're doing new things with old machines. And it's a 50-50 half cotton, half linen blend with this really vibrant blue. It's like that royal blue that you usually get from your indigo when you've worn it like four months or so or so but the whole gene starts out that way killer but this is like a 1920s ish construction worker idea it is not a reproduction gene but it's vintage inspired so it's inspired by yeah like 19 teens 1910s 1920s levi's where you get the really wide leg huge top block high rise buckle back two pockets in the back all that stuff and they're just a ton of fun to wear I don't wear them that often but that's kind of the thing they're like a specialty pitcher they only come in when they're needed so even if I only wear them like five or six times a year when I pull them out it's always like okay this is the perfect jean for this fit it's a lot of enjoyment all in one pair of jeans so that's cool but I needed a workhorse pair and the indigo invitational was beginning and so I got Flathead 3005s. They were legendary. What pushed me over the edge there was I had heard a lot of good things about them already for years, but I heard Jake, Almost Vintage Style, and Kyle, Rock Transformed, talking on the Stitch Perfect podcast, and each of them lined up their top 10 denim companies. And they had a lot of similar choices in different spots, but the only one that they had exactly the same opinion on was the flathead. And they both put the flathead as their number two slot. Their second best gene that's available out there. And they talked about the fit. And they talked about the fabric. All these things that uh, were just phenomenal about them. And so I thought, that's what I want to try. Now this was my first unsanforized shrink to fit I had had the tanukis I had had the onis I had had the sugar canes and those were all unsanforized one wash so I didn't have to worry about that whole shrink to fit process but I did a ton of research I talked to a lot of people and I thought I was prepared I'm like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna finally try this shrink to fit thing and I think it's gonna work uh, Franklin and Poe helped me and yeah I I nailed it I nailed it. I'm actually wearing them right now. And so those I wore religiously for over a year, and I continue to wear them. I really, really enjoy that pair and still do. And somewhere in there, I ended up with my Black Sign Vocalion jeans. This is a pair that I didn't really plan on getting but I kept seeing Jeff Denim Dentist post his on Instagram and they had such a the only word for it is a vibe they had such a vibe it was crazy like I'd never seen anything like it and to this day I haven't really seen anything like it I'm going to do a full review on these soon they're like a four pocket 1890 Levi-ish kind of jean. They're loosely based on that, but they modernize it with modern construction methods. And in addition, they make some changes of their own. Like instead of 
just suspender buttons like you would have on an 1890 Levi. They give you belt loops, and then they give you these internal suspender buttons, which are easy to remove and all that. And then uh, they make some aesthetic changes of their own, which I think are key in making these look even better than an 1890 Levi. So in addition to the classic things like the crotch rivet and the um, exposed rivets on the back pockets and the, the spike cinch on the back and everything, they remove the yoke. So there's no yoke on the back. And so they have this clean surface area, just stuff like that. Yeah, a really, really cool jean. And that has become one of my favorite pairs of jeans of all time, ironically. It's like a 10-inch leg, 17-inch back rise, more than 17 inches. Um, it's a huge jean, so a thin guy like me, it's like, why why, why would you wear that? Uh, but they really do work. It's just this really relaxed uh, aesthetic and look. And then, yeah, the last pair of jeans is my unsanforized one-wash warehouse duck diggers. Uh, the 1001 XX DD47. It's a 1947 repro. I did a recent review on those. And what that represents is all that I've learned up to this point as far as fit and my taste in fabrics and all that. Like Almost every single little detail of those jeans is representing everything that I found I love the most in my jeans. And I got it all in one pair of jeans now. So those I'm going to focus on for a while. And I'm not going to like promise this, but what I'm trying to do for the next year is wear mostly jeans and not other pants. Like I do like other pants. I'll wear them sometimes on like, oh, you know, like I'm just going to go to church. I'm just going to wear some different pants for, for just there until I get home. Or maybe if I have a certain occasion I want to go to, I'll wear some chinos or whatnot. But I think for the next year what I'd like to do to just get some really good fades is mainly just rotate the warehouse duck diggers the flatheads that I'm wearing and the black sign vocalions and just try to get those you know a lot further down the road as far as fades go um, which I have no problem doing like I wore only jeans for years so it's it's not one of those forced things sometimes you're like I'm only gonna wear this pair of boots I'm not gonna wear any other boots and it's like well that's gonna be really hard dude or I'm only wearing flannel shirts you know um, this isn't such a far cry from what I've done in the past. Um, I naturally do gravitate toward jeans, although I do like wearing chinos and other pants on occasion. Anyways, that's my denim story. Um, you know, you don't have to write a book or anything, but you know, what's your denim story? You can put it in the comments, just like highlights or, or things you learned along the way. I figured this might be interesting for some people and, uh, let your jeans take you to places more important than the jeans themselves. We'll talk to you next time.